Welcome to the hidden bookcase. Come in, have a seat, get comfy. It's just next to the sliding library ladder and right below the shelf titled Spooky Month. Pick a book, your favourite book. That's the one that opens this room. Inside you'll find a warm fire, a loving cat and a wide skylight to the stars. And a really towering to be red pile. I'm Morgan, I use they them pronouns and I am a war crime. I'm Soren, I use he him pronouns and I'm a douchebag who uses lip balm. I'm Zoe, I use he they pronouns and I am falling calm and limp as is natural for being virtually drowned. We've been friends for 10 years and are always swapping books. But despite having the same taste in books, we never get around to reading each other's recommendations. It's always just another book on the pile. It's a seriously big pile now. It might crush me in my sleep. So each month we're going to force each other to read a book. The new reader will give a blind summary of the book. We'll both go away and read it and then we'll return to chat about it. So this week, let's get to talking about... Gideon the Ninth by Tamsin Muir. So welcome to Zoe, our friend of 10 years. Oh yeah, yeah, I totally didn't just meet you guys this year. <laughs> Once you've been on the Hidden Book Ghost, you've automatically known us for a decade, actually. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Time gets edited, and then there'll be like all these new photos appearing on your phone. I'm crazy. So we have a special episode of the Hidden Book Case. Rather than one of us having read the book and recommending it to the other, we have two people who have read the book, Morgan and our guest Zoe. So I need both of you to tell me how you found out this book. So I feel like we should let our guests go first. Zoe, how did you find out about Gideon the Ninth? So I am a religious watcher of book YouTube or booktube, if you will. I always turn to this one lady, shout out my girl Peru's project when I'm looking for Christmas presents from my father because she really loves sci-fi and fantasy. And so does my dad. And so I heard the summary of this book. I'm like, this sounds so good. I need to read it. And when I get gifts for people, I like to get them things that also I like so I can read it later. So it's really just shopping for myself. So my dad read this and he was like, Zoe, oh my God, you have to read this. And so then I read this, a couple months went by and then I read Harold the Ninth, reread this one and I've just been a complete shell of a human being ever since and can only talk about this book. And that is not an understatement, it is literally all I talk about. And Morgan, what's your history with Gideon the Ninth? When I was in first year of university, I went for coffee with a friend and they were like, I have this book that you need to read. And they just handed me Gideon the Ninth. And so I took it home with me and then lockdown happened and that was really fun. So I didn't give it back to them for almost three years. It took me almost a year to read it the first time. The first half took me forever. The second half I read in like two seconds. And now I've reread it like too many times. But the other day I was having a little think and I was like, I think my godfather sent me a link to this book and was like, lesbian necromancer in space sounded like it was a you thing and I was like oh yeah classic I'm probably not gonna read it though and now I'm like this is one of my favorite books of all time and I didn't even connect the two and can you guys tell me what Gideon the Ninth is about <laughs> good luck what is this about so there's this girly right she's butch as hell she's strong as hell Name's Gideon. She loves fighting with a two-handed sword. She wants to leave her home planet, and so she does with her sworn childhood enemy, Hail Harknon and Jesimus. And then they go to the spooky house with other people in a contest. There's also necromancy and skeletons and such. That was pretty succinct, honestly. I'm quite impressed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I explained the entire plot of the entire series to my partner who read half of this book and declared they hated it because it was in space. So... <laughs> They're not in deep space for like any of it. Oh, I have opinions about that because I don't know if it's full because I don't know if you'd figure it out from the first book, but it's obvious on a second read. Am I okay to just say it? Sure. This book is set on Earth. Yeah. Is it? Oh, I'm stupid. I didn't read that. I read it three times. There are nine planets, nine houses. Oh, yeah. It's post-apocalypse. And it's blue. And it's got salt water. Oh no! How did I not realise that? <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> also, is there like a Greek god thing going on? Pluto is nine and that's death. I think that the world has been reinvented from a biblical and a classical standpoint. I think the person who reinvented the world is just a big nerd. That's my hot take. Should we listen to your blind react, Soren? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm very curious. Okay, I'm gonna go as quick as I can with Gideon the Ninth because I feel like I know a lot about it, but I also feel like everything I know about it is useless. So we're gonna see. Um, broad strokes, I think this is like a post-apocalyptic setting and humans have gone extinct but have then been brought back. Not sure by whom? Maybe by Gideon? Maybe Gideon is a necromancer and maybe that's why Gideon looks like a skeleton. Speaking of Gideon, Gideon is Gideon the Ninth because there are a number of houses, maybe maybe nine of them. Um, I think I know this because I feel like I've heard people talk about someone the Eighth and about houses. 
I'm, I'm not sure what they mean, if they're like schools of magic or factions of some kind. No idea. Um, Gideon is the tall redhead with the big sword. That The cover's kind of a dead giveaway if I hadn't seen Fan Art, but I also know about Harrow, who's the short one with the ribcage, the extra skeletal ribcage, who I sometimes think is Nico D'Angelo when I see Fan Art, but it's not Nico D'Angelo, it's Harrow. Um, and there's also a character called Corona Beth, I think, which is not a name that has aged super well. I don't know what they do at all. I just, yeah, I believe they exist. Um, and I have no idea about, like, anyone's personalities or relationships, although I've, I feel like I've heard this described as enemies to lovers, but also been told that it's not a romance, but I feel like there's something between Harrow and Gideon, but I don't know if that's entirely true or if it resolves or if it's just a fandom thing. Um, I know that at some point God makes a nun pizza with left beef joke. I couldn't tell you how that is going to come up, but apparently it will. <laughs> and I also think that there's some highbrow references in this. I think it's like a mix of there are some meme internet culture type references and there's also some classical literature references and historical references and things, so I'm expecting a blend of the two. Uh, lastly, I know that the author used to write Homestuck fan fiction, and I've been told that that's a pretty good indication of how complicated and multifaceted this kind of story is. I gave up on Homestuck, so we're gonna have to see how this goes. Let's jump in. You're right on a lot of that, actually. <laughs> yeah. For some reason, I was getting a lot of Corona Beth fan art right before. Oh, I know why. When the second book came out in paperback, there was a short story in the back that focuses yeah. a lot on Corona Beth. I don't really feel like I had any predictions there because there was just too much to get through. We didn't get to Nun Pizza with Left Beef yet, unfortunately. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> that's a big deal. There's a, a, a Miet to the Cat reference at some point. I think it might be in the second one, too. I didn't spot that many. I'm sure I just missed a few. I, I got, while well, everyone else was learning common sense, Gideon still the plays. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think there's a lot more in book two because yeah. there's more characters who have been around longer. Tumblr kids are the only ones that got brought back after the apocalypse. You had a yeah. good first kid. <laughs> Gideon did not bring people back. That was definitely wrong. Love that I was no. just like, maybe Gideon's God. It was a good mix of unhinged theories and basically correct theory. Mm -hmm. It interests me that you heard about someone called the Ape when Colin the Ape is not important, really. <laughs> when I first read it, I my favorite character was Silas Optikisaron for some reason, just because he sucked so goddamn much and I appreciate <laughs> that in a character. <laughs> Everyone is just so nuanced and they feel so multifaceted and real. And often you hate them and it's great. It's so great. And there was no issue with there being that many characters because they were all so memorable. Mm -hmm. How do we feel about the cover? I love it. It's sexy. The font is so goth. Love it. Got the perfect amount of silly also just with the aviator sunglasses. I love how all the books have this little skeleton on the spine of them so you can line them up and they look all fun. This copy doesn't have any of my sticky tabs in it but my copy of Harrow has a bunch of them. I remember distinctly my pink tab was used for things that I deemed gay. So there's a lot of that. <laughs> I feel like that is a running trend on this podcast. You know, when she's like, why am I born so attractive? And Harry's like, because otherwise someone would have throttled you by now. This is the longest slow burn enemies to lovers you will ever read. Oh my God, I know. The number of people I've seen sell this as enemies to lovers romance. And then people read the first book and they're like, this is disappointing. I'd heard enemies to lovers, but I was happy with the yearning. It was so palpable. I was having a great time. I mean, obviously I thought they were going to kiss after the pool scene. I think they did. I think they did. I think they went to pound town. <laughs> <laughs> How else are you supposed to consecrate a uh, Magnus is doing it, so you know. <laughs> Let's go. When Gideon's like, mm, it would horrify me to sleep with my necromancer, and then several pages later, Gideon's like, so I've kind of always been in love with Harry in a sort of obsession way that means I thought it was hate, and I wrote get out of my school in her locker. <laughs> I feel like Hera would give Gideon like a get out of my like necromancy <laughs> note. Get out of my tomb. Yeah, I get out of my tomb. <laughs> How do you guys feel about the world building? The world building is very large, but it's not very reported on in this book. There's mm -hmm. clearly a lot there, but you don't really know anything. Like, it's not until you read Harry that you get a more fundamental understanding of the world. I did love the complete lack of world building as an exposition. Yeah, it just throws you right into it. I love that. I'm always obsessed with that. I hate reading exposition. I hate writing exposition. I do not care. 
I'll figure it out later. And I think it's done successfully here. You're not mm -hmm. never confused, but you learn things at the right pace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you are confused, you're usually confused on purpose. Even Gideon doesn't understand most of the world building because she's just been living in a hole. Yeah, she's like a son, what? Yeah, there's little bits of her being like, I don't understand what a bath is. And, mm -hmm. oh, this is not the prayer that I've been learning for the past 18 years. That's a bit weird. We're in a cult? Yeah, what? <laughs> We're in a cult, what? But she does just go along with it. She's like, Harrow, I hate you. I hate everything about you. And then she just wordlessly is like, yeah, of course I'll stick to the vow of silence and I'll wear the face paint mm -hmm. and I'll do everything that you ask. Speaking of the Gideon Harrow relationship, do people have a favourite cavalier necromancer duo? When Abigail died, when I, my roommate was reading it, like it was like late at night and I heard her exclaim, no, from her room. And I'm like, oh, you got to that part. Because she was talking about how much she loved Abigail and loved Magnus. Abigail and Magnus are so... Yeah. And sometimes I think about the fourth house for too long and then I get sad. The triple teens did not deserve any of that. That's what when the genre suddenly switches into hardcore yeah. horror. Yeah. The lights flickering off and then on again. Mm. Gideon waking up to seeing Jean-Marie like that absolutely yeah. breaks me every I time. Know. All the deaths in this, honestly. Which is also surprising because you're killing so many people, you'd think it would lose its impact. Towards the end, I was clinging on. I was like, Palamedes is still like, he's going to live. It's, he's so yeah. close. It's going to happen. No. <laughs> Let's go, pal. <laughs> he died really coolly, though. He yeah. does. He's an absolute icon. Honestly, the sixth mm. house. I love them. I love them. I just love Pal and Cam's whole vibe. They just both know each other so well. They are the perfect Cavalier Necromancer relationship. They really, really are. The whole Cavalier Necromancer dynamic is incredible. It's so good. It's so good. It's so fun to play with. It's so fun seeing all the different arrangements of it. Right Hand Man is already one of the best tropes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To like function the whole magic system and plot around it. Incredible. It is so built to be a codependent relationship which is always right up my street I love a good codependent mm -hmm. relationship you get to see seven different sets of how the Cavalier relationship works with the Necromancer and how they're all codependent in very different ways Silas feeding on Colum, you've got Gideon mm -hmm. and Harrow going absolutely feral in the corner whatever the hell the Tridentarius's and Babs have going on they just bully him and even if you take Corona to be the Cavalier of that relationship it's so interestingly up. I'm obsessed with it. I'm obsessed with how Corona's like, she could have taken me. It makes me sad when I think about the name meanings though, especially Isaac, because in the Bible, he's the sacrificial lamb. Mm -hmm. I noticed Protest Alois because I'm familiar with the Iliad because my partner loves the Iliad. I'm like, oh, I know what happened to this man. Then he didn't die first. I was like, what? Then it turned out he did. <laughs> It was a double bluff. Mm -hmm. I'm really emotional about Camilla because in the Aeneid, Camilla is the only female warrior and there's like a whole part of book nine of the Aeneid dedicated to talking about her and how impressive she is. Meanwhile, we have Ianthe or Ianthe or however you pronounce it, which um, mm. just means purple flower, aka violets, aka gay. My favourite one is for Harrow below her parents because Peliamina comes from Peleus, who's the father of Achilles, and Priam Hark comes from Priam, who is the father of Hector in the Iliad. And they're the two warriors who hate each other most and they fight each other, but they have the mutual respect. And I just put a note next to that that goes, Harrow hates herself, Hark. <laughs> oh no. Because she's two sides warring. I like that she named all of the eighth brothers as well, and then it just never came up. You can just imagine she's got the little on Wikipedia on her laptop of everybody and how they connect. Moving on to characters who are favourites. Sorry. If your Palamides isn't your favourite, I will eat my own hat. <laughs> This man is so incredibly up your street. He's Percy Dorolo with necromancy on top. I can't come on this podcast and lie. Yes, he was my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Harrow was up there, but that man was just like, that's like Soren Bay. Like, that's not fair. <laughs> He's got the silver hair, he's got the glasses that do the anime flash. Morgan, who was your favourite? I think Harrow is my favourite character. She's just unhinged and I love her. Mm -hmm. Pal and Cam and Gideon make a strong second. But I think Harrow has to take it. I'm also a Harrow stan. She's just so pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> and... So well written, especially going into the later books, how Tamsin writes her having mental illness is so well done. My other favorite character is Jean-Marie because it's such a tragic character. I really love the little baby butch. The 
scene where she's admiring Gideon's biceps. It was so cute. Yes. I'm like, girl, I've been there. <laughs> the way that her and Isaac are like written in smaller font whenever they're like murmuring to each other. Yes. That was so cute. All the characters are just too well written. That's the problem. Mm, it's very difficult to choose. I love Corona and Anthe. Trantarius's Uncree Thurso. <laughs> I love the dynamic. I love the fact that everybody, even Harrow, assumes that Corona is the better necromancer, but Corona just loves Ianthe. Reading through this book again and just seeing every single time it's so obvious that Corona is not doing necromancy. Yeah, I know, it's so funny. They're like, oh yeah, everybody's breaking up a sweat except Corona. She's just so good at this necromancy stuff that she's not yeah. breaking up a sweat because she's not doing necromancy. Yeah, I know, but Gideon's just like, she's just so hot. It's like totally fine for her. I'm like, Gideon, please. <laughs> The description that Tamsin has for Yante the first time, she describes her as wraith-like. I'm obsessed with that description. It's so good and it tells you so much. Even side characters, I immediately wrote down at the start, Crux advanced like a glacier with an agenda. That energy is kept throughout the whole thing. These really creative, fun descriptions of characters and their movements. I love that Tamsin isn't afraid of Rose because a lot of times in necromancy, they're just like, oh, the dead came back, they're fine. But this one, full body horror, but not to the point where it's gratuitous. And I love that because when it's used correctly it's so good especially because she throws in anatomical words too the correct names of all the bones like adds to the mystery and the grossness of it all i really appreciated that in the climax as well Hara's choking on her own bloody mucus <laughs> which made it feel much more visceral as opposed to her just being like gideon i'm dying and i look really hot while i'm doing it <laughs> yeah and I love the concept of blood sweat too. It's so gross. How does Harrow have enough blood to lose at any point of this book? Because she's always bleeding. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Oh, I also love how Palamides learned so much medicine for Dulcinea, attempting to cure her himself. This boy is down a horrendous. Fully, chivalry is not dead. Fully Victorian gentleman. He's never even met her. I know, only by letters. Palamides gives off ace vibes, connecting emotionally to a person who is so unattainable because it means that he doesn't have to romance anybody. It fed me, honestly. I wanted to talk about how she does disability. Let's talk disability. I love how normalized like some of the characters are like, yeah, whatever, disabled. I glamine, cool badass lady, missing a leg. Nice. She does mental illness so, so well in the next one because she's talked about how she has struggled with schizophrenia in the past and wanted to convey that through Harrow. And that was really, really well done. In one of the short stories, one of the characters is learning to grapple with their newly disabled body. And that was done really, really well as well. How it was difficult, especially if you were so used to it working and all of a sudden it doesn't and how frustrating that was, but it's how it's not the end of the world either. Yeah, she does do it so well. Harrow in book two struck so many chords. Even Aanthi trying to deal with the fact that she's missing an arm now is so well done in the second book. It's nice having, I mean, I guess she kind of wasn't, but having a terminally ill character in the main cast. I think usually when that's in a book, it's like the whole book. People know and love terminally ill people and they have an impact on other people's lives beyond their terminal illness. Negative impacts and neutral impacts and positive impacts, obviously. So it's really nice to see a character with a terminal illness be an active agent in the narrative. Dulcinea is like having a time. She's allowed to be in love with Gideon. Even though it isn't Dulcinea, Kitharea is still terminally ill. She has just been terminally ill for 10,000 years. It A explores that feeling of being chronically ill over 10,000 years, like can you even imagine? On top of that, the fact that Kitharea isn't pretending to have this cancer, which would have been kind of gross. Yeah. Yeah. She actually is, even throughout the fight, she's like coughing up lungs. Soren, were you expecting Gideon's death? How did you feel? Yeah. Obviously when it was happening, I was like, oh, this makes sense. Because mm. it had been set up. As soon as she was like, well, I have an idea. I was like, I know what you're going to do. And she has some passive suicidal tendencies earlier mm -hmm. on, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess I wasn't shocked that I was emotionally affected. Definitely wasn't predicting it from the start. It absolutely blindsided me when I read it. Oh. Me too! The sudden switch to Harry's point of view. Get up, Gideon said. And I was like, <laughs> I'm going to cry. <laughs> We're coming to the end, so before we wrap up, do either of you have any quotes that you wanted to share? I know Morgan does, I can see it in their eyes. I mean, I love the whole pool scene monologue. The end part, you are my only friend, I'm undone without you. <sighs> First flower of my house. Gideon Nav, you are the best of us. Can I also submit, if it had been possible to die of desolation, she would have died then and there. As it was, all she could do was lie on the bed and observe the smoking wreck of her heart. Mm-hmm. What mm -hmm. the hell? I know, what the hell, Tamsin? Like, Jesus Christ. 
Calamity Sextus became a god killing star. I just love that turn of phrase. Cam, go loud. Yes. yes. Just so simple, so good. You're going to die spewing your own lungs out of your nostrils, having failed at the finish line because you couldn't help a prat about why you killed innocent people as though your reasons were interesting. Calamity is fully Victorian man. Calamity is saying chicanery. He says some other random thing at some point. I learned so many words from this book. I think I learned banal from this book. I think that's where I learned it, and I thought it was pronounced banal. <laughs> That's how Gideon would pronounce it. To be yeah, fair. <laughs> humbuggery is the other one. That humbuggery. He says. That was the one. It's like you are a Victorian man. The number of things I highlighted as foreshadowing at the beginning of their book. They're like the necromancer joined with their cavalier, and it's like, what did you think joined with meant? Yeah. They literally say it in like the first hundred pages. Even one flesh, one end. Truly one flesh, one end. There's this one bit where they're theorizing and Hara's like, these experiments all demand a continuous flow of energy. They've hidden that source somewhere in the facility and that's the true prize. You walked in with the source of the energy. She's standing right next to you. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna cry. So, Soren, I feel like you have to start with your final thoughts. It's five stars. Of course it's five stars. It's like ten stars. This is the best thing I've read in so long. It's just so creative and it's not pulling any punches and it is so unashamedly itself and brave and neat and well-paced and well-world-built and well-characterized. Like, everything about this is incredible. This makes me so happy. Zoe, how would you rate Gideon? Well, obviously five stars. It is my favorite book. It is the only thing I talk about. It's just so formative for me as a writer. So formative in my identity as a masculine lesbian. It's just nice to see it in literature. Morgan, how would you rate Gideon? Five stars. Five across the board. Five across the board. Everything about it. World building. Humor pace, relationships. It ticks so many boxes and I go absolutely feral every time I read it and I discover something new every time I read it. Is it my favourite book that I've ever read? I don't know. But it is the book I've reread most in my life. I've read Gideon four times now. It just gives so much every time you read it. And then when you read the next book, you have to go back and read the first book because you uncover so much more stuff. Do we have any recommendations for the listeners? I have one. It's The Unbroken by C.L. Clark. If you're looking for more mask lesbian in fantasy, it's kind of like a fantasy retelling of the French occupation of Northern Africa. And you have our lovely butch paladin named Touraine. I'm in love with her. Oh my God. Uh, the working title of the book was Touraine's Arms. So Touraine is a soldier in the army of the militia that's occupying her home country. She eventually becomes a person personal bodyguard of a princess who's trying to change the system from the inside. It has fantastic disability rep. Our princess has chronic pain and is cane user, which is great to see. Magic system's cool. Military fantasy's cool. If you liked the swords, there's swords in this. If you liked the fighting and the weird parental relationships, there's that and that. I don't know if I can think of anything else because this is so singular. Yeah, it is. I haven't read anything else like it. If you're looking for more like a himbo lesbian like Gideon, The Unspoken Name by A.K. Larkwood is fun. It's crazy sci-fi. Our main character is a orc lady and she's got an emotional support wizard and it's just <laughs> absolutely insane. The writing is weirdly lyrical too. It's quite the ride. Oh, actually, if you want unhinged lesbians, I just finished reading literally today our oh, Wives Under the Sea. It is just unhinged, like vibey, weird, lyrical. This is a really difficult one to recommend for. I was going to say this is how you lose the time war, but I feel like that's commonly recommended with this, but mm -hmm. that is also science fiction. It's also poetic. It's also kind of enemies to lovers. It's sapphic, wild, and doesn't give you any exposition and has insane creative world building. I think that brings us to the end of the episode. So Zoe, thank you so much for being our very first guest. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Oh, I, I took any opportunity to gush about this book, man. <laughs> and if people are listening and they want to find your work, is there anything you want to point them towards? God, I'm in all the listless podcasts. Am I in all of them? Yeah, I'm in all of them. <laughs> if you're looking for my crazy writing, you can find it in Tranthologies. I did four episodes for that. I'm Zoe underscore Web on Twitter, which <laughs> gives you an inkling on how much podcasts I do. Zoe dot Web on Instagram. For the second half of Spooky Month, I didn't have anything queer and spooky to wreck. So we've decided that we're going to read the new Jonathan Sims book, which is Family Business. And neither of us know anything about it because that's the point neither of us have read it so we're breaking our format it's gonna be fun so please join us in two weeks for family business by jonathan sims until then you're always welcome through the bookcase don't forget to give the cat a scratch on your way out thank you for listening to the hidden bookcase a production of planar prod on this episode you heard zoe davis morgan greensmith and soren briar discussing gideon the ninth by tamsin Ware. 
You can find out more about this book at publishing.tor.com slash author slash Tamsin Moir, and you can follow Moir at Taz Moir on Twitter. A big thank you to Zoe for being the Hidden Bookcase's very first guest, it was so lovely to have you. You can follow him at Zoe underscore Wab on Twitter, or Zoe.Wab on Instagram, and you can find their wonderful writing, producing, and more across the board at The Listless Network. Find The Listless Network at listless.ga. You can find The Hidden Bookcase on Twitter at Hidden Bookcase, and on Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, and TikTok at Hidden Bookcase Podcast. Find out more about Planar Prod at planarprod.com. Do you want to be a guest on The Hidden Bookcase? We'd love to have you. If you're interested in chatting to us about your favourite book, go to planarprod.com to find our form to apply as a guest, or you can email us at thehiddenbookcase at gmail.com. If you're enjoying The Hidden Bookcase, please consider leaving us a rating or review, or you can always tell a friend how to find us. Your whispers are the best way for bookworms to discover our show. On our next episode, which will be out on Monday, the 24th of October, we'll be discussing Family Business by Jonathan Sims. We hope to see you then, and in the meantime, you're always welcome through the bookcase. <laughs>